Do you believe that the influx of Muslims to Canada is putting Canada under siege? There's a truck driving around Toronto and it has an ad and the ad says, is this Lebanon? Is this Yemen? Is this Syria? Is this Iraq? No, this is Canada. Wake up, Canada. You are under siege. And that ad seems to suggest that the impact of the immigration of Muslims is very threatening to Canadians because siege is a term of war, right? In medieval times, you would lay siege to a to a village or a town or a city or a country. And that was in an attempt to take it over. And people often talk about the threat of Muslims having this secret agenda where they really want to uh, build a caliphate. They want to take over. Right. I'm not Muslim, but I've heard people discuss that. People of you that are those of you that are more uh, more informed about Islamic thought, I'd love to hear your 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 opinions. Is there really this secret conspiracy by Muslims to take over Canada and build a caliphate and impose Sharia law on us all, or is that something that people that are people are using to fear monger? So there, there are three issues that I want to talk about with this whole idea of Canada being under siege. The first is the area of my expertise, legal. Is this hate speech? So there are restrictions on our liberties to talk in Canada. Some people might say that's fortunate. Some people might say that's unfortunate. Um, I tend to be more of a free speech absolutist. But I say that as someone who's had some horrible things said about me for racial grounds alone. But this is what the law says. I got the Martin's criminal code here. I'm going to read from it. And it says that Everyone who, by communicating statements other than in private conversation, willfully promotes hatred against any identifiable group is guilty of an indictable offense or a summary conviction offense. And everyone who, by communicating statements in any place, incites hatred against any identifiable group where such incitement is likely to lead to a breach of the peace is guilty of an indictable offense. So there's the whole inciting hatred and there's willfully, willfully promoting hatred. I don't like this type of legislation because what is hatred and what is an identifiable group? Uh, for, for an example, there's a lot of, I would say, uh, a straight white male is an identifiable, identifi identifiable group. I would also say there's a lot of terrible things that are said about straight white males, but no one cares because it's all about power, right? But imagine if you said the same things about Blacks or Jews or gay black Jews <laughs> that you say about straight white males, would you get away with it? Would the public response be the same? Probably not. So hatred is taken is something that takes into consideration context. And when you get into context and hatred, there's a whole, a whole lot of subjectivity. And when you get subjectivity and discretion, that is the that is the seat of discrimination. That is the seat of oppression. So I don't like the legislation. I think the way it's worded, if someone looks like Muslims and there's a lot more sensitivity now towards Muslims because of a crazy rise in hate speech that's happened since Gaza, a rise in hate speech and, and even terroristic attacks against Muslims, right? The stereotypical terrorists, and Muslims aren't terrorists, so all of them aren't terrorists, some of them are, but like there's not a general thing that Muslims are terrorists. I just want to clarify that now. But there has been a rise in acts of terrorism against Muslims. We saw that with Muslims. We saw that with the Afsal family in my hometown of London, where they were they were run down, right? Family of Muslim in Canada, where you're supposed to be safe, going for a walk during COVID, and they get run down by Nathaniel Veltman. So the the relations between the public and Muslims are changing. The threat that exists to Muslims is changing, and I, I wouldn't. I'd be concerned if I were a Muslim person, especially an identifiably Muslim person, I'd be I'd be really concerned. In fact, when the tragedy with the Efsal family happened, I'm not Muslim. I don't look like a stereotypical Muslim, whatever that looks like. But I was concerned that someone has it out for non-traditionally looking Canadians. So on one hand, yeah, there's there's a bit of a concern. But on the other hand, I don't think we should be regulating what people say. I think that this uh, this truck driving around may qualify as hate speech. And I don't think that's a good thing. I don't think that's a good thing. I think we should be able to express ourselves and say things that are offensive and say things that are likely to promote hatred. Because if you have a right to free speech, but it's curtailed at every chance, and the way it's curtailed, it's kind of arbitrary and it's subjective. Because in determining whether or not hatred is uh, exists, the government or the, the courts will look at, and I'll read from the commentary here, hatred connotes emotions of an intense and extreme nature that is clearly associated with vilification 
and detestation. Only the most intense forms of dislike fall within the ambit of this offense. This offense does not require proof that the communication caused actual hatred. In determining whether the communication expressed hatred, the court must look at the understanding of a reasonable person in context. That is very subjective. That is very subjective. What I might see is likely to be vilifying. Someone else might not see that. So I think this legislation could very well be abused. And all of a sudden, saying that the Liberal Party sucks could be inciting hatred against liberals or saying the conservatives suck or saying whatever you want could be inciting hatred. So that's the that's my legal analysis of that. I kind of included in that a, a bit of a social political analysis um, in, in the sense that the, the there's there's a lot of interactions of different groups, right? There's the there's a whole idea of some Canadians, whatever that is, some real Canadians, the ones that were born here that have like European last names being offended that people like me or people like the Abzals or people that might have beards or wear hijabs or wear turbans or whatever, the, the second tier Canadians are threatening their way of life because Canada should be for the Canadians, presumably white people. And then if you go into some deeper, deeper, darker parts of the internet, you'll hear ideas of like replacement theory and white genocide and how it's a massive conspiracy by uh, a certain group of people that are trying to deep they try to interbreed with everyone so they they could rule us all right so i i understand the and, and I'm, I'm kind of in the middle right because i was i was born in another country raised by immigrants but i also come to canada and I'm, I'm someone who believes themselves to be canadian whatever that means and i think the importance of assimilation and preserving uh preserving your what makes the country i think that's important i think that if someone's comes to a country that's a Western country with democratic ideals, they should adopt those democratic ideals. Now, there are a lot of Muslims that do that. There are a lot of Nigerians like me that are do that. There are a lot of Indians that do that. They come to Canada and like, yeah, we like these liberal democracy ideals and we want to espouse that. But there are some people that come from some countries that don't have those same values that come here and they don't like that idea at all. And Canadians are starting to notice that more and more and saying, well, I'm a Canadian, not just in the fact that I have the citizenship, but I'm also a Canadian in the fact that I believe in these Western liberal democratic ideals. And these people are coming and they're also Canadians, but they're Canadians that want the benefits of being Canadian, but they don't really believe in the Western democratic ideals. They don't really believe in the rights of women or the rights of marginalized people or the rights of people who don't share their faith and belief system to have the same things that they do. And if they were in power, they would actually change things around and they would institute the ideas and policies that they had back in the country that they're from. And some Canadians are taking notice of that and they're speaking out against it. And I think that if you feel threatened by an influx of ideology, not people, I'm not necessarily xenophobic, I'm not xenophobic, but I think some ideologies are terrible and some ideologies that are terrible are in some countries that espouse those ideologies. And if people are coming from those countries with their ideologies and trying to impose those ideologies in a country that's a liberal democracy, that could be a cause for concern. And then I already mentioned this a bit, just the personal aspect of it, right? I am uh, born in Nigeria, raised here. I still, some things about me are still very Nigerian. And some things about me are not so Nigerian. Um, I appreciate the good from the culture that I come and I appreciate the good from the culture in which I was raised. And I appreciate that if I'm in Canada, there are things that are inherently Canadian that predate me. And if I want to continue to exist here, I need to at least be comfortable, maybe even uphold those values. And if I don't Oh, I got a notification. And if I don't like that, I could always leave, right? Just like all the racist people said to my family in the 80s and 90s, go back to Africa. Still an option. What are your thoughts? Is this hatred? Is this xenophobia? Should this be allowed? Do you think there's a threat from people with different ideologies coming into Canada? Let me know in the comments.